Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Book Trek 2021. This is a five month mission <laughs> being led by our intrepid Captain Vin at Revenant Reads, in which a group of BookTubers embark on exploring Star Trek fiction month by month, each month a different franchise. So for August, we're doing Star Trek the Original Series, my own native Star Trek series, which has spawned hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of books. So there's an infinitude to choose from. I have a huge number of these things as ebooks, so I've been having a ball doing a huge amount of rereading, using as my sort of theme that I am not going to reread Star Trek novels. There are a handful of Star Trek novels, probably 40, that I've read many times, that I know I know them really well. I love the authors. I love the plots and whatnot. I'm not going to them. This is not going to be the greatest hits. Instead, I'm going to Star Trek novels that I maybe bolted once very quickly and forgot, Star Trek novels that maybe I didn't like, that I read and didn't like. I'm trying to revisit them. Uh, so that's what I'm doing throughout the month of August. That's what I'm going to continue to do uh, throughout all of Book Trek 2021. I have only two Star Trek The Next Generation novels that I liked, and I love both of them. I'm going to I'm gonna avoid both of them and just do the run-of-the-mill Next Generation novels, most of which I read, but I... It, that it, Next Generation will be terra incognita for me. It was close as we come to Terra Incognita. Then Deep Space Nine, I, I was heavily invested in Deep Space Nine right from the beginning, so uh, I read all of the books attentively, so that'll, that'll be slightly better ground. And then my beloved Star Trek Voyager. I remember reading advanced, uh, very preliminary notes about Star Trek Voyager, and one of those very preliminary notes about some sort of starship that is somehow stranded at a, a distant part of the galaxy, so that your immediate question if you're a Star Trek fan is, okay, what's the crew going to be like? And I remember reading one of the earliest released notes about the show was that it was going to feature an old Vulcan man. So a, a purebred Vulcan, not, not half-human like Spock, and not young like Spock either, but, but a Vulcan who's you know, 100, 120 years old, something like that. That immediately fascinated me. Uh, and I, I, as a result, read a great many Voyager novels very interestedly. So the, and Star Trek Enterprise doesn't count as terra incognita because... Not because I know the show really well, but because there were comparatively fewer novels, so it was much easier to cover the ground. Star Trek The Next Generation will be the real uh, voyage of discovery for me here, not Star Trek Discovery. <laughs> we're leaving that until next year, I assume, for Book Trek 2022. Thank God. Uh, but the, it'll be, I'm going to use the Next Generation portion next month of Book Trek 2021 to really grapple with Star Trek The Next Generation. I famously uh, I've said a million times on this channel, I don't like it. I think it's very boring and very preachy. And maybe there's a way for me to change the way I look at it that will open its riches to me. It clearly has those riches, right? It was Star Trek to a whole generation of people who, who love it passionately. I'm not willing to say, you know, as a classic 20 million Frenchman can't be wrong. I'm not willing to sit on my high horse and say, they must all be wrong. It's it's entirely possible that I will learn a lot from Star Trek The Next Generation. But uh, for August, I'm reading Star Trek, the original series books that I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to the first time around. And one of the elements uh, that we've talked about in terms of Star Trek, the original series, is that time becomes an active element. Our characters age. They, they get not only, not only to go from being whipcord young men, youngish men, they become old people. In the course of, of canon adventures of Star Trek, they become old people. That had never happened before. That is, is absolutely fascinating. You know, no one expected... I, the example I always bring up is Batman and Superman. No one ever expected that the Batman of the comic that you read in 1961 would be 25 years older than the Batman comic that you read in 1955. No one expected that. Batman doesn't age. That was typically the idea, right? Buck Rogers doesn't get any older. Flash Gordon doesn't get any older. Suddenly in Star Trek, thanks to the movie franchises, they do. Because you want to use the same actors. The fan favorites. The, the fans are driving this whole thing, and they want their cast back. Not just their crew back. And as a result, the experiment that was the J.J. Abrams' Kelvin universe, where you do actually recast all of the, char or of the characters was decades in the future. Instead, in Star Trek The Motion Picture, what we got was a noticeably older central cast. And that noticeably older part just kept going. <laughs> Until finally it became somewhat unrealistic. Right? By, Star by the last traditional Star Trek movie, Star Trek The Undiscovered Country, 
by that by that point it was slightly unrealistic i mean it had in in <laughs> It, it's like it become unrealistic to have these characters be action adventure heroes, which is a large part of what Star Trek was, especially the character of Captain Kirk. To the extent where the bridge movie between Star Trek: The Undiscovered Country and the the Star Trek: The Next Generation movies, the bridge movie Star Trek Generations, features John Luke Picard in command of the Enterprise rescuing Captain Kirk, a Captain Kirk well past retirement age, from a temporal nexus bringing him back into reality so that the two of them can fight the supervillain. And when I was in a packed theater when that movie was showing, and when it get, we get to the moment where Kirk and Picard confront the villain, Soren, it's at that moment that you realize that the writer and director, and probably Bill Shatner himself, intend Kirk to be duking it out with, with the villain. They intend him to be leaping and jumping across canyons and down catwalks and at taking punches and giving them. And the first moment that that realization became obvious in the audience where I watched the movie, the whole place filled with laughter. I didn't laugh. But the whole, space, the whole place filled with laughter. And it wasn't intended. Star Trek people are generally wonderful. But that was a pretty cruel moment for me to sit through. Uh, and it was a perfect sign that it wasn't any more believable. That that Jim Kirk, two-fisted, you know, Captain Cochran, Jim Kirk, was no longer really believable. And then, of course, in Star Trek Generations, that Kirk dies. And it was, it was kind of a way, the only real way of, of saying goodbye to that kind of expectation. That our original cast could still show up, but they would be senior citizens. They wouldn't be karate chopping people anymore. Uh, and the fact that you could get that kind of transition is, is naturally chum in the water to writers. You know, writers are now, especially Star Trek fans, are going to want to know stories from that transition. That transition is, I think, at least as interesting as the actual plots of Star Trek VI or Star Trek Generations. That watch, we love these characters, watching what happens to them as they shift away from ever being that uh, iconic crew anymore is fascinating in its own right. And that clearly motivated our, our, the author of our Star Trek book today. The author is Christy Golden. And the book is the last roundup, where she, I guess, got permission from Paramount, or got her idea approved, to put that original iconic Star Enterprise bridge crew together one last time. Uh, a, a retired Academy instructor, Jim Kirk. So well, well past the time of Camp Kittimer, well past Star Trek VI, but before Star Trek Generations. That Captain Kirk, far more ample of waistline than the, than the character that we see on the cover here, uh, agrees to join an expedition to settle a, a Starfleet colony in a distant part of, of the Alpha Quadrant. He goes with his two nephews, who are uh, canonical in the sense that we meet them as, as boys in Operation Annihilate, and we meet their mother, Orlin, and we know that Jim Kirk's brother dies in Operation Annihilate, uh, the, the twins are canonical. The, the, the boy can be saved. The mother and father don't survive the, the flying pancake parasites of that episode. Uh, the, the boys do. Peter does. Kirk's nephew does. And uh, he's a grown man in this episode, and he Kirk goes with his nephews to this world. And he manages to convince Chekhov and Scotty to go with him. The rest of the crew is still scattered all over the place. Uhura has a storyline in here. Spock has a storyline in here. Dr. McCoy has a storyline in here. Uh, and on the, the distant planet where this adventure is taking place, Kirk and crew, although they aren't a crew, this is a Kirk without a starship. And Kirk and cast eventually uncover a secret that looks like it could threaten the whole Federation. And uh, that phenomenon is well done. In fact, everything in this book is well done. Far more so. I borrowed this as a hardcover when it came out. I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, this came out as a hardcover, and I borrowed it from the bookstore where I was working. I found the, the, the premise that this is the last time the crew comes together to do anything irresistible. Uh, the whole crew, I should say. Because one of the Next Generation novels that I'm not going to be reading for Book Trend 2021 is about a part of the crew coming together one last time. Uh, I, the premise is irresistible, and I would have read it anyway, even if it was the biggest pile of junk in the world, but Christy Golden has a real good ear 
for just narrative just in general. I didn't check her biography before I made this video, but I'm assuming that she's written a huge number of books. You don't get this good at the quotidia of scene shifting and characters sounding different from each other and keeping the action moving, unless you've done it a lot of times. Uh, usually, you don't. And her grasp of Captain Kirk is really good. Her grasp of, uh, not so much Spock, but McCoy, yes. Uhura, yes, absolutely. Even Scotty. Uh, I felt like I was watching not just those characters, but those characters in, in and around the time period of Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, when they have markedly changed. They are not uh, the same kinds. One of the things that you notice right away in the movie, Star Trek VI, I'm still lobbying behind the scenes for a Book Trek 2021 live discussion where a bunch of us get together and talk about this stuff. Not just fiction, but the movies. The movies seem like a natural choice for us all to talk about them. People's schedules, I don't have a schedule. I'm not even wearing pants. But people's schedules are very hard to align. I would still like that to happen. One of the things that you notice when you watch Star Trek The Undiscovered Country for the first time is how much the characters have changed. It's not just Scotty strolling into a, a briefing room and saying, I just bought a boat. It's not just that. It's Kirk just really not wanting to be Kirk anymore. It's the famous line, you know, where Spock says about the Klingons, they're dying, and Kirk says, let them die, is one thing. But the thing that really jumped out at me in the movie is something that was unthinkable in any other Star Trek movie, where Spock con uh, contacts Kirk on the Enterprise and with a concern, and Kirk sighs and says, Spock, I'm really tired. From staying up too late. Not from fighting Klingons for an hour, but for, from staying up too late. These are different people, in other words, and their, their evolution to these different people is not charted in canonical episodes. It's not charted in canonical movies. Instead, there are jumps, there are leaps. And this is one of them. This book, I think, is clearly meant to show us uh, at least Jim Kirk between Star Trek The Undiscovered Country and Star Trek Generations. So this is a, a sort of a last look at these characters together before you get Star Trek Generations, which gives us a, a kind of Kirk, a kind of Chekhov, a kind of Scotty, and then another great big leap to the first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, which gives us a Dr. McCoy, who's 131 years old. Uh, it's an era, a lost era. There's a whole string of Star Trek novels that don't fit with what we're doing in Star Trek 20, in Book Trek 2021 is dealing with franchises. There's still plenty of opportunity to do all kinds of other things for Book Trek 2022. And one of those would be spin-off series. Star Trek The Lost Era, Star Trek Vanguard, Star Trek Minotaur, is it? Uh, there are all kinds. Uh, Star Trek Corps of Engineers. There are all kinds of things that don't fit our remit for this year. This book is clearly meant to sort of squeeze in an adventure uh, between those two movies that reads like it would work uh, uh, with the characters in those two movies. I'm perfectly okay with that. And I enjoyed this the second time a lot more than I did the first time. It looks like a lot of, got a lot of callbacks to Star Trek fans, got a lot of callbacks to, to uh, later Star Trek incarnations of these characters. So it won't, I don't know how much it will work for somebody who's never had any Star Trek or never experienced any Star Trek. But like I said in an earlier video, those kinds of people are kind of rare. Even if you've never read Star Trek, even if you've never heard or watched any Star Trek, you still know a little bit about Star Trek. You kind of, sort of do. But the the, uh, the call-outs and Easter eggs in here, are, there are sufficient numbers, so I'm not sure I'd recommend this to somebody who wasn't reading, who didn't know Star Trek. But if you did, worth your time to read. Very much so. No idea. It's these little uh, trips down memory lane, I have no idea what happened. If I ever owned a copy of this book, I think I borrowed it from the bookstore and then just gave it back and maybe made a few notes on it in private. But I might have found it used. I might have bought it. In which case, if I did, I have no idea where that copy is. Perfectly happy to have it as, as an ebook. You know, it's not good enough for me to have it in, in, in any other way. It's not good enough to take up space here, as is true with a lot of Star Trek books. But this is, uh, this is the 20th of August. So August has a little more than a week left before before we move on to the next generation. That's a lot of Star Trek. I will probably be tempted in this upcoming week, provided I'm not wiped off the map by Hurricane Henri. I'll probably be tempted to, to do a lot of Star Trek video. There's so much. Well, I'm not going to cover more than a tiny fraction of what's out there. But I still feel like I haven't I haven't mixed things up enough in terms of the kinds of things that I'm doing. 
I'll, I'll, I will work on that. I'll, I'll try to mix things up even more for tomorrow. Find something. I, I, I've been looking through my ebooks for a Star Trek novel that I just plain haven't read. And I, I, I think I got to all of them. If you'd gone through those original years as a fan when you were just starved for anything, you'd compulsively read this stuff too. Uh, but I, maybe I can find one that I just don't remember at all. And that doesn't jog any memory, so that the reading is like a first experience. But we shall see. Uh, but I urge you to follow the hashtag, BookTrek2021. The last roundup was uh, one Star Trek book that I read last night. I also read Star Trek Invasion Part 1 by Diane Carey, who's my favorite Star Trek author, so I'm not dealing with her in my, Star, my book Trek videos. Uh, but I read, I read Invasion Book 1, which was written by her, and the concept was created by her, specifically because Vin at Revenant Reads ripped her a new one in his review of that same book. And I thought, I thought the great thing about BookTube, I thought, was it possible that you could just be completely wrong, that it isn't any good at all? It's not one of her better Star Trek books, but Vin didn't mention a lot of the good stuff that's in there. I just needed to reassure myself of that. So I did a private Star Trek reading that I knew I wasn't going to share with you. But then we have this one, and tomorrow we'll move on, maybe much, much later in the Star Trek fiction universe. Or maybe... Uh, or maybe... I don't want to scream. That's all. I don't want to, I'm perfectly willing to ignore a lot, but I don't want to scream. Uh, and also, I should point out again, there is no emergency. That's just an a-hole who doesn't want to stop for the light. That's all. There is no emergency. Uh, just so you, you're not worried. But uh, uh, Maybe I can pick a, a Star Trek novel that's, that's pretty far off the beaten path, but that isn't quite one of those satellite spin-off series. With The Next Generation, I'm going to have a much easier time. Because it'll be practically fresh fields for the novels. I'll read all around. I'll, I'm going to try to do a video a day for September of Next Generation novels. And I'm going to watch a lot of Next Generation. Not just the movies, but the show. I'm going to watch a lot of it, too. Uh, to try... I, I'm, I'm going to go into it wide open to change my view of this series. To up my estimation of it. There are a lot of factors that may work in that favor. I haven't read, reread a lot of these books in forever. And I have the experience of watching Star Trek Picard to kind of, sort of, put The Next Generation in a bit of perspective. I also haven't watched a lot of Next Generation episodes in a long time. So, but, but for now, we're in my Star Trek. So we'll see what we do tomorrow. I'm, I, I, I'm leaving the choice up to sort of spur-of-the-moment randomness uh, right before I turn into a pumpkin at night. When I, I, I'm lining up my reading, I'm lining up what I'm going to be doing for the night. I've sort of been picking at random. I think I'm going to try to, for this last week and change for August, I'm going to try to do some really interesting discussion topics for Star Trek. There you go. And I will also continue to work behind the scenes to get my co-hosts to maybe set aside time for a Zoom chat. Wouldn't that be great? A Zoom chat would be great. I'm not going to shoot for the moon here with a live stream. That would be awesome. You could ask questions about Star Trek. But a Zoom chat would still be great. I'll keep trying. <laughs> Not everyone can do this all day long, right? So uh, I'll keep trying. Though. In the meantime, I'm going to wrap this up. The last roundup is a, a pretty much a recommend, uh, and we'll see what we encounter tomorrow. Thank you, BookTube.